Welcome to Campaigns and Coffee. Grab your mug and let's dive into tales of adventure and the answers to your quirkiest of questions. Today, we're going to talk with Chris about learning a new system in a genre you understand and his Cities Without Number campaign. So I guess that should, I should get started here. So let me explain a little bit. Um, yes, this is the part where you talk. Yes. <laughs> so it's... If you've listened to the show at all, you know I'm a big cyberpunk genre fan. Um, coming out of Cyberpunk 2077, but going back a lot farther because, yes, I actually did read those books back in the day when they were published. And, and so, you know, I know the genre really well. And then we all got into this bad boy. So this is made for radio. Um, <laughs> Cyberpunk <laughs> Red, I'm showing the Cyberpunk Red uh, source book, and then trying, and you know, we all got in and learned that system. And I think for a little while there, that system is cyberpunk to a lot of people, right? The, the interface system, or more specifically, the system that is built into the video game, which is different than the, the pen and paper one. And the pen and paper one is much more complex. Mm -hmm. But you begin to think in that way and you begin to especially think in terms of Night City, especially um, from a setting standpoint. Right. Well, I started I wouldn't say collecting, but it's sort of happening that way. Other cyberpunk role playing games like The Sprawl, which mm -hmm. is uh, powered by the apocalypse uh, setting which has a bunch of really great stuff in it. And then <clears throat> the one that I'm running right now, Cities Without Number from Kevin Crawford, is his kind of uh, old school, what was it called? Old school revival? Old school, OSR, old school revival, OSR, old school renaissance. Yeah. Um, something like that. You know, it, and these, I think it's like over 10 years old now, so I, right. I don't know how renaissance-y it is anymore. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'll go with it. It's an OSR game. Sure. But you know, uh, based on his uh, stars, stars with uh, stars beyond number and worlds, worlds beyond worlds number, beyond which number. Was, yep. yeah. So it's it's an extension of that. But I'm trying to run a campaign in cities without number, and in cities without number, you create the world with a bunch of really great, and I cannot speak highly enough of the random tables that are in this game to help spur you because it fi I found out that I needed it because every time I would sit down to try to make this game, it was in night city <laughs> or it was in because that's, or it was in Chiba or it was in, you know, the, the Los Angeles of um, snow crash or that kind of thing. I wanted to, I have a habit of taking things from my hometown, Cleveland and turning them into my, into my game setting. Mm -hmm. So I took the tools in Cities Without Number and created Terminal City, which if you know Cleveland, there is a the Terminal Tower is downtown. It's a uh -huh. train reference, but in a cyberpunk reference, it's also kind of a nice reference. So it, it works on multiple levels, but trying to learn a new system and a new setting is really, really tricky. And I, I would love to open it up to the floor for folks because I know you guys have run games in different systems. What techniques have you put together for yourself to learn? Like, for instance, Cities Without Number has its own net hacking or net running, you know, mechanism. It is similar or it, 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 it smells like the one in Cyberpunk Red, but it's just different enough. The sprawl has something similar, but it's just different enough. The all of the the smells, all of the all of the tones of cyberpunk are in these games, but the mechanics are different. How do mm -hmm. you guys deal with that? Because for me, I'm very lucky in that one of my players, um, Overlord Johnson, Chris Johnson, is a stickler for the rules. <laughs> he he's an absolute stickler, and I love that about him because I'm not. Uh, we make a good team in that way. But he'll be the first to go, all right, well, let's go check the rules. Let's go do this. We, we ran into a thing where he was hacking last week. And it was like, you know what? Maybe we should have read these. Maybe we should have read these rules. <laughs> <laughs> but when we got into them, it was like, all right, this is very similar to, but completely unlike. 
<laughs> this this other thing. So, right. you know, as a point of discussion, how do you guys deal with learning a new system in a setting that you're well that you are well versed in? Hmm. It's a good question. Hey, the the only one that I can think of that I did before was um what was it? Uh the my most recent one obviously would be um Dungeons and Dragons. You know, mm -hmm. going from three point five to five. Um mm -hmm. but it had been so long that yeah. I don't know that it was necessarily uh it it was a different game, mm -hmm. basically. You know, it's yeah. just like it's like the way that I did it was uh, oftentimes is just find someone who's already playing the game and and mm -hmm. play it like at a con or uh, whatever, and just play a couple of times, and that kind of gives you the feel for it, um, and then uh, and then run it yourself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it. it Part of the old school, the OSR uh, side of things is, you know, they're, they're saying we're going to play the games like they used to play it. And in my digging into things, <laughs> I realized, like digging into Gamma World again after many years, I realized that in my head and the way that I used to play it was not at all the way the rules were actually written. Um. You know, so it was much less deadly in in my games back then than in actuality. Yeah, it, it, that's a tough question because it's even tougher for me because I don't have like a local group that I play with on a weekly basis mm -hmm. sort of thing. So I haven't had to do that in a long time. Um, <laughs> and the stuff that we have done has been, uh, you know, it was, it was Fate, which I've done before. It was... Um, Scum and Villainy, which none of us had ever done before. Mm -hmm. um, and it was supposed to be like Star Wars with the serial numbers filed off, but it didn't certainly didn't feel that way when we played it. It was much mm -hmm. more of a, a heist sort of game. Um, yeah, I don't know. I Hopefully, Ken, I'm hoping you have a better answer than I do. <laughs> the hounds from Night City have returned. The koi dogs are barking <laughs> in the background. Sorry, Chris, you were going to say something. I was going to say, you know, I think about it when I watch you kind of switch between, say, like a Savage Worlds or a, or, or a, some of your sci-fi games and then going to like Mothership, right? Where you know space horror, you know alien, you know, you know, these things, but then you'll have two different systems. And I'm sort of looking forward to seeing how I, I know Savage Worlds is putting out a big sci-fi yes. compendium thing. Thank you, David, mm -hmm. for something else I have to buy. You're welcome. But, My enabling um, is uh, still uh, going. You know, and I bought it myself, it. so you know, at right. least there's that. But I mean, you know, another you know another example from just my personal life was like the Dresden Files game is written in Fate. I'm running it in Savage Worlds. Those are two very different things, but you can you can line things up when you do your stuff, Ken, because you had to learn Cyberpunk Red. You know, you're 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 a Mothership fan. You know space. How did you how did you approach it? Is it just brute force cramming, or how do you? <laughs> I think that I think the easiest way to do it that I have found has been to write a one shot. And when you're writing that one shot, think about the set pieces you want to do, but also be thinking about like what is it about the game that you're you're looking to try out? Because every game is going to have its interesting mechanics. Um, there's something that drew you to that game in the first place that was different from say Dungeons and Dragons. So I wrote. Uh, a one-shot adventure for fantasy Savage Worlds. And I and I knew that Savage Worlds has this sort of over-the-top, fast, fun, furious sort of thing. And I wanted people to be able to take advantage of that. Because in D&D, &D, you can have it in D&D &D too, but I think the way that dice explode in Savage Worlds, as I've said before, like mm -hmm. it gives you the opportunity to do those sort of Lord of the Rings moments where you run up under the troll's back and shoot him in the head a couple of times, right? Which I don't know that people do in D&D &D to the same extent, if, if they're following no. the, the, mm -hmm. the rules, right? And so... For me, it was I've never had fantasy characters using Savage Worlds. So like one was building out the PCs that I was going to run at the con, building out the NPCs, creating the set pieces. I also mixed things up. That particular session was like a meant to be. What if the drow won? Right. The drow, the drow have devoured. The sun has been devoured 
and the drow now rule the world and you guys are living underground because that's the only place that's safe and, and what have you. So it also gave it sort of a thematic twist. Mm -hmm. But I knew going into it that I wanted to lean into Savage World's strengths was like encouraging players to take risks, right? Um, and so I think as you switch genre, when you switch games, but you're in the same genre, knowing like, for example, complex tasks, if Savage Worlds can do them, D&D can do them as, as skill challenges, like how would I diffuse a bomb in right. this particular sci-fi setting, right? How would I do net running, right? Like if I want to learn the net running rules, I would include it. Um, <laughs> I think from a practical standpoint, so that's one way to do it. I think another is what we did with Cyberpunk Red, which was you just do a series of little one shots to say, we're, we're just going to like get together. We're not actually playing the campaign yet. We're just going to figure yeah. out these mechanics, right? Because <laughs> I think that's mm -hmm. one of the things that taught me getting ready to actually run the campaign was, well, weapon ranges in, in Cyberpunk Red are actually super important. Right. If somebody has an assault rifle, their effective range is much further out. And if you're used to designing a map where everything's really close, the person who's got the solo with the sniper rifle or the assault rifle, they're never going to get to be that guy or that girl or that person. Right. Because they need to be up on the skyscraper looking down and then, I don't know, paragliding in to help when things get up close. Right. Um, especially if you know that you're going to have that solo who's not the street samurai who's literally pulling out a katana to slice and dice people. In that case, it's a little bit different. But I think. Having those options, like even when we did the one of our little, I think it was basically our session zero in terms of actually running a game, which was the, the BioBlocks adventure, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to figure out how um, APT would actually do hacking. Like, mm -hmm. How do you use the net running rules alongside regular players in a game, right? But I also wanted there to be a story. And that's also when I learned that um, <laughs> our nomad can just crawl through ducks as she is trying to infiltrate the, the facility, which I did not anticipate. So now I'm building out the, you know, the, the, I was going to say dungeon complex, the CEO, the, the corporate headquarters complex that you guys are going to go into next. I'm thinking about duct work because I just think that Omen is going to try and find her way into it, even if maybe that's not a great idea. So I think it, it is entirely to possible. recap, just it is entirely possible. I think these things like setting yourself up, what, what am I trying to road test? And then, either building it into your scenario or not. And I think it's also important to not get caught up in the rules. I think it's okay. And we've done this with cyberpunk red, like pausing the whole game for 15 minutes to go and look up the net running rules. I don't know is particularly helpful when you're trying to keep things moving and we all have limited time. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if, that, if your group's into that and ever, that's how everybody learns the system. Totally cool. Right. And some people can't have fun if they're not, it diminishes their fun if they're not playing by what the actual rules are, right? right. We even do that in D&D, &D, which is a game we've been playing for decades, right? Like, how does this particular mechanic work? You know what? We're just going to hand wave it. We're going to come back later, and we'll use it in the next session. We'll do it right next yep. time. Yep. Yeah, close enough. And I've done that. I've done that sort of thing. I think you're hitting on a really important point here. Is that I have, um, I've never prepared one-shots, usually. I think in campaigns, and that's a problem. It wasn't really until I began playing with you guys and kind of doing the, the six game arc that, that we've done a couple of times that I began to appreciate that um, as a as a finite thing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about you guys. Maybe it's just because of the D&D &D stuff or the people I played with, but you started a campaign. <laughs> maybe it ends or maybe it just fizzles out. I don't know. But I think you bring up some really good points is, you know, designing sessions around the things you want to learn. I think they, that's something that I can take away from this conversation. So, you know, I've got, I've got five hours before I'm supposed to play with the guys tonight. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I'll go and like design a, design a net architecture in the, the cities without number away and then give Mr. Johnson something to work on in tonight's game. Yeah. I, I think Ken had, uh something earlier that you were talking about where in say a savage worlds game you have legolas running up the back of an elephant you know and mm -hmm. doing doing a flip and shooting three arrows at a time sort of thing um whereas in D, &D you said that that doesn't really happen and what's interesting is it totally could happen oh yes but there are certain games where um the rules are lighter more open um 
or there's a like in Savage Worlds, it's Fast Furious fun. There's there's a there's a theme to the game itself where it says you are allowed to do this sort of thing. Your you, permission mm-hmm. has been given to the players and GM to like just go crazy or to you know be gritty. Um, and then there are like one of the things I, I enjoy playing Five E when I've played it, um, but there it's one of those games where it doesn't seem like a GM making a rule up at the table is like, it's frowned upon. Um, Hmm. Like it does, like it says in there that make it up as long as it's fun. I think they even name rule of cool at one point, but they keep adding so many more rules and so many more uh, classes and subclasses and everything else like that, that it's like, well, if it doesn't have a rule, that means I can't do it is, is a lot of the mentality that I hear in D&D games. (laughs) Yeah. So that's think, a big one. I think for any game that you're playing, new, old, something you're familiar with, uh, I think giving yourself permission to do that is important. So with our part of the with my Elemental Apocalypse game, which is Five E, was I wanted to have more of that over the top, um, Resident Evil, Underworld, Tomb Raider, desperate people in desperate times taking mm-hmm. big risks feel to it. And we all went in knowing that that was going to be the case. And so I gave Mm -hmm. people extra feats. I gave people, I'm giving out magic items like candy. I'm, you know, when we think about what would be the coolest thing we could do here, we do it, right? I come up with more compelling and interesting and diverse battle maps, which I actually have to work on later today, right? So I think part of it with your group is just saying, we are doing something different. Let's get into that mindset. And that helps (laughs) a lot. When when I was running D&D for my nephews, um, who had never played D&D before, you know, at one point, uh, my older nephew was like saying he wanted to run up and jump. And like he used the Fortnite, you know, first person shooter 360 no scope sort of terminology uh, with his arrows. And technically, you're not able to do that really in d d <laughs> but it's all special effect. You know, (laughs) what's the difference between, you know, pulling back and letting go of a single arrow and running up and, you know, doing a 360 and then shooting, shooting an arrow? Um, You know, yes, in the real world, that is much harder. However, in the fantasy world, you could just do it and feel epic and awesome, which is what the game is supposed to help you do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to to say make a make an acrobatics check for me, because I want to see if something amazing happens or something horrible happens, but yeah. Think, yeah. Was, and that, and that comes up with, that comes up with a, you know, if you want that to happen, don't call for the role because what if they fail, you have yeah. to have a consequence yeah. for it. So yeah. like, if you're cool with it, just, you know, if it's not really going to affect, you know, how the boss dies, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It, <laughs> just let it happen sort of thing, you know, it, but some games are, feel more rigid to run. So do we have time for a question from one of our listeners slash minion slash henchmen slash people who follow this um, podcast? I do have one. Uh, we'll see how, how well we can get into it. It's uh, I'm trying to remember where, where it was from. Uh, I, it's uh, Oh, it's from one of our future overlords in training. Uh, if I wanted to start a hobby on the side, like baking or knitting, how could I integrate it into my dark persona? This is where I think adjectives are really important. <clears throat> You're not just baking a cake. You're baking a cake of doom. <laughs> yes, branding You're, is everything. <laughs> right. Those aren't knitting needles. Those are weapons. You know, maybe they're coated in some sort of exotic poison. Maybe you're making something really terrifying. You're not just knitting a blanket. You're knitting a smothering device. You know, it's all in how you look at it. It's, it's you know, again, start small, start small. But, yeah, I mean, just, you know, adge- adjectives are important. I right. mean, it's it's something we do every day. 
and and maybe it's something that we kind of forget about. I mean, we don't just call it a laser. We call it a death ray. You know, and maybe right. it's not a laser. Maybe it's a maser. <laughs> maybe it's shooting gamma rays, whatever. We call it a death ray in, in the adjectives mm -hmm. important. You know, right. so I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree. I, I think that's a good way to integrate some hobbies in there. Yeah. Hey, so you can go from like start off simple with the brownies of doom and then move on to like the bake of, baked Alaska of the apocalypse. Like, sure. you know, oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Everything can go wrong with the baked Alaska. Mm. And, yes. Right. That's really just combining all of those hobbies into one. I if mean, your house burns right. down. Right. Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> I mean, there's baked Alaska Oosh. and then there's baking Alaska. And right. You know, and those two things would go together very nicely. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> baking Alaska while having a baked Alaska. That's good. All right. Only the laser beams hadn't ventured off course. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to answer more of your questions and uh, we'll join you again on campaigns and coffee sometime again soon.